Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to INE's webinar for understanding and implementing multi contacts and failover on ASA firewall. For uh, some of you who do not know me, uh, my name is Rohit. I am a full time instructor with INE, and um, I've been in the industry for about 20 years now. And I have five CCIs, CCI and route switch, security, voice collaboration, and service provider. So without wasting much time, let's quickly get on to um, system contacts and creating multi-contacts and looking at how failover works on the ASA. So for demonstrating this, um, this webinar, I have a topology here. We would be using two ASAs, uh, two physical ASAs. I believe it's 5515X. And uh, <clears throat> we would be configuring multi contacts and doing active standby, active, active failover on, um, on this topology. Now, if you look at from perspective of multi contacts, why do we actually need to do multi contacts? The only reason I can think of is that the reason why you would want to, to create multi-contacts is to create virtual firewalls. So sometimes you may want to use uh, maybe different configuration for different customers. Let's say if I was maybe a service provider and I was giving a firewall as a service to, to customers. So instead of me having one physical ASA for one customer, which really is not cost effective, I could probably create virtual firewalls. It's something like multi-tenant or um, creating virtual devices. So taking one box, one physical ASA, and virtually dividing that into as if it was like a separate ASA. Configuration remains completely separate. Routing table remains completely separate. Obviously, the resources uh, of the virtual firewalls would be shared by shared from the physical ASA because at the end, uh, the ASA is just one. The physical ASA is one. So your memory, your CPU, your XLATES, your NAT translations, your limit basically um, is shared by the virtual firewall from the physical ASA. So if I was a service provider and I need to provide uh, firewall services, I could just take one physical box and create virtual firewalls and allocate one virtual firewall to a customer. Obviously, there are some prerequisites that you need to meet to, to configure virtual firewalls. Now, <clears throat> obviously, again, licenses also. So from perspective of licenses, depending on what license you have, you can create that many virtual firewalls. I believe two is default. And then if you want more than two virtual firewalls, you need to get a license for that. And um, if you look at uh, a physical box, a physical ASA, by default, it is running in single mode, which means it's just one physical box. And that's what you can configure that ASA for. But if you want to create virtual firewalls, the first thing that you need to do is create, uh, change the mode from single mode to multi or multiple mode, which, which kind of supports virtual firewalls. And that's the first thing that you need to do. Once you change your mode to multiple, what's going to happen? The ASA is going to reboot. And uh, once it reboots, it comes back to the console where you basically reach the system contacts. So when I use the word contacts, it basically means a virtual implementation of an ASA. So there are some prerequisites when you actually create virtual firewalls. Uh, the first one is if you want to create a virtual firewall for a customer, you need to have system contacts is there by default, but you need to have an admin contacts. So when I use, let me in fact draw it out for you. Um, let me take this. So let's write it down. So let's say I have a physical box and I change the mode to multiple. What's going to happen behind the scenes? Once the ASA boots up, you basically boot up in system context you basically boot up in system context. So system context is 
basically used to manage the physical resources of the physical ASA. For example, let's say if I want to create virtual firewalls, I do it from the system context. If I want to allocate resources to a virtual firewall, I do it from the system context. The system context is only accessible through console. And you cannot, you cannot assign a port or an interface to the system context, which means, let's say if I have a fresh ASA out of the box, I take it out, I change the mode, I connect my console, I change the mode to multiple, and the ASA reboots, I, where would I reach? I would reach the system context. What do I do from the system context? I can allocate resources. So let's say I can prepare for the virtual firewall. I can prepare myself, I can prepare this ASA, to support virtual firewalls. So what I'm going to do at the system context, I would take my physical interfaces, do a no shot. I cannot give an IP address to an interface in the system context because there's no interface allocated to the system context and your system context does not process your data. So the only thing I can do is do a no shot, maybe create some sub interfaces if I want, maybe do port channeling and um, allocate resources or create some resource class. For example, let's say I want that customer one, which is one virtual firewall, can only use 50% CPU or maybe 50% of your x lates for your NAT. And uh, customer two can maybe use 25% of your resources of the physical ASA. Now, if I don't do that, what's going to happen? By default, you have unlimited resources of the physical ASA. So let's say if customer one uses 100% of the X lates, customer two is going to suffer. That's why you would want to create um, some resource management or some class where I define how much one customer can use. By default, there's no limit. That's why you would want to create a class and all that is done in the system context. System context, like I said, it is only accessible through console because you cannot give an IP address to the system context. So when you take an ASA out of the box and you want to configure multi-context, that's the first thing you do. You change the mode to multiple, you go to the system context, connect a console, and maybe give a host name, do a no shot to your interfaces, create some classes for defining how much each virtual firewall can use the resources. You define that and then you create the virtual firewalls, one for each customer. Again, depends on your license. Now, there's one more context, which is built in. System context is built in. It does not count in your licensing. There's one more context, which is mandatory, it is the admin context. It's lowercase admin. So admin context is the default name which Cisco has given. So admin context is again, a mandatory requirement for you to create virtual firewalls. You need to have an admin context. Now, what is an admin context? Admin context is like the system context. It is used to manage the system context and also to manage other virtual firewalls. But the difference is that in admin context, I can allocate an interface for management purpose. So I can access the system context from the network. So instead of me physically going to my ASA and connecting a console, because sometimes you may not have a physical access to an ASA. So with the admin context, I can allocate one interface, maybe the management interface, I can allocate that, enable SSH or Telnet, and then remotely connect to my ASA and manage or create virtual firewalls by going to the system context from the admin context and creating virtual firewalls or allocating resources to a virtual firewall. That's the admin context. You need the admin context to create virtual firewalls for customers. Now, without the admin context, it will not let you create the virtual firewalls. It actually shouts back at you saying, hey, admin context is required, mm -hmm. so you need to create that. Most ASA firewalls, they have the admin context by default unless you delete that. Once you delete that, then you need to create the admin context again before you create virtual firewalls. So these two contexts, they do not really count in your licensing. However, other, so when I would say the third one would be custom context. The custom context is depending on your license. So how many virtual firewalls you can create 
that depends on your license. Default is two, but if you need more, you need to get the license for that. So that's, the, that's how the ASA is basically divided. You are actually creating virtual instances of the firewall. And each of them, they would have their own running config. And the running config can be stored in the flash or maybe to an FTP server. So, so every customer would think that I have a dedicated virtual firewall. Obviously, it's not dedicated, but he doesn't really know because for him, it's one ASA and he has an X amount of uh, resources that he can use and he can manage his firewall remotely because obviously as, as a service provider, I would probably give him access to the WAN IP or the LAN IP and give him SSH access and then he can manage that. So as a provider, I have two options. Either, either I just give him a service, I give him a firewall, I just do the basic config like an IP address and maybe enable SSH a username password and hand it over to the customer and he can manage that he can manage his own firewall and one virtual firewall and the second virtual firewall they both do not interact with each other so there's no way customer one would be able to log in to customer two's uh, virtual firewall because they're completely separate they're completely separate running config the only, only common thing between them is the physical ASA, the physical resources. But as a customer, you don't really know whether the ASA is just for me or, or it's shared. You really don't know. You just think of it as one physical box. Just virtually, we are dividing that into logical uh, virtual firewalls. So as a customer, you are completely secure and um, you can manage your own firewall. And as a service provider, I could give him two options. Either I just configure the ASA basic configs and give it to him to manage, or maybe I do manage services also, and I manage everything for him. So my admin of my organization, who's, who's basically logging in with the username password of the admin contacts, he can manage all the custom firewalls, all the custom virtual firewalls. So I could even sell that as a service. That's the advantage of um, creating virtual firewalls. Now, what I'm going to do is <clears throat> we will start by building the virtual firewall. I will build that step by step and I will explain each command and what are the restrictions and uh, what things that you should keep in mind when you're building your ASA firewall to support virtual firewalls. Let me go back. And uh, <clears throat> so here, if you look at this diagram, I have two ASAs. At this point of time, I would only touch ASA1. So we would only use ASA1. We would not touch ASA2. We will get ASA2 when we do failover. And if you look at ASA1, it has two interfaces going to, let's say, the service provider. Maybe R1 is like the PE router. Maybe it connects to a service provider. Uh, and um, I have two interfaces going towards the ISP. And I have two interfaces going towards the customer. Now, why do I need this also? Why do I need to have two interfaces? Again, for redundancy, maybe I could do port channeling. Maybe I could do a port channel and then give it to customer. So even from customer's perspective, uh, with failover, I have a failover for the ASA. And with port channeling, I would have a failover for my interface. So in case if one interface fails, my WAN interface fails, customer would not even know that the interface has failed and switched over to another interface. So normally you would want to do port channeling. Your multi-contacts does support port channeling. However, there are a few restrictions which we will talk about. So, <clears throat> Uh, when we actually do, uh, when we actually configure the virtual firewall. So I'm going to start off with the ASA1. And the first thing that I will do is change the mode to multi context, to multiple mode. So going back to my ASA1, it's a blank config. There's absolutely nothing. It's a fresh firewall out of the box. And if I do a show mode, you would see that default mode is single, which means I cannot create virtual firewalls at this mode. Uh, it's only one physical box. So what I would do is go back to config T and change the mode to multiple. This is going to initiate a reboot. And once the ASA reboots, you are going to reach 
the system contacts. And that's where we do, we manage the physical ASA. Because right now I still haven't created virtual firewalls. I'm still on the physical ASA. So I still have to do a few things. I have to prepare the physical ASA to allocate some interfaces to a customer, depending on what the customer requires. Let's say if the customer says, hey, I want three interfaces. I want one for LAN, one for DMZ, maybe one for WAN. So depending on what the customer requires, I would allocate those many interfaces. Now, obviously there are times when you don't really have those many interfaces. You may have just four, or maybe you have eight interfaces on your firewall. So does that mean that I'm restricted? No, I could probably create a sub interface on the ASA. I could do a sub interface and then on the sub interface, I could do a port channeling. So just to give him more redundancy and I can have more customers also on the firewall, again, depending on your license. I believe the maximum virtual firewalls that you can create depending on license is 250. So 250 virtual firewalls you can create. Again, like I said, that depends on your license. I believe this ASA um, supports two virtual firewalls. So we'll see that you can do that. You can check that out by doing a show version and that should show you how many virtual firewalls you can create. <clears throat> In the meanwhile, I'll just reboot ASA2 also just to save time, though we would not be using it right now, but for failover, your mode has to be the same. You cannot have one ASA running single and one ASA running multiple. So I might as well just do this while the ASA one is rebooting. <clears throat> Virtual ASAs, they kind of get a bit faster in the reboot, but um, Officially, they don't really support multi-contacts, but there are versions of the virtual ASA which kind of support multi-contacts also. So now I have booted up, my ASA one has booted up, and uh, if I do a show mode now, I am in multi multiple mode, and I am in the system context right now. I am physically connected to my ASA through console. So I am in the system context. There's no way you can allocate an interface to the system context. So there's no way I can remotely manage this ASA uh, using the system context because system context is only console. But if I want to remotely manage this ASA, then I can create an admin context, which is again, a mandatory requirement. So if I do a show version, you should see how many virtual firewalls I can create. So if I look at security context, it says that I can create two virtual firewalls. Now this two is custom context. System context does not count in the license. Admin context does not count in the license. So if I look at my config now, let's say, if, let's give a host name, ASA, let's say X1. And if I do a show run, you'll, you, you'll notice that the configuration of the running config is pretty smaller. It's pretty sh small from perspective of single mode. Because in single mode, we have built-in uh, policy groups. We have some class maps which are built in. But since this is a system context, you really cannot create class maps. You cannot create policy maps or anything. The only thing that I have here is I have some interfaces, the physical interfaces. I have some class default and uh, that's it. I don't really have any policies. But if you are in single mode and if you do a show run policy map, you'll see a built-in policy map. If you do a show run class map, you'll see a built-in class maps because there in single mode, I'm actually giving an IP to an interface. I'm assigning policies to my interface, but here I am in the system context. So what can I do from here? Also notice one thing, the admin context, like I said, it's built in, it's by default. Cisco has given an admin context which gets created automatically and that's lowercase admin. You can customize or create your own admin context. So maybe I can go and remove this admin context and create my own admin context. It does not really need to be the same name. You could name it whatever you want, but you have to define the admin context first before creating the virtual firewall. So what I'm going to do is I'll delete, I'll kind of delete even the admin context. So maybe I'll do a command called clear configure context 
So this kind of removes everything. It removes the admin context also. And where is the configuration file stored? It is stored in the flash. I could send it to an FTP server. So if I do a show flash, you should see anything that has the ending with cfg.cfg, that's a configuration file for a virtual firewall. So maybe I can delete that also. Let's say delete star.cfg. This deletes all the configuration files from my flash. Again, you gotta be careful with this command because sometimes, you know what, we do delete star and hit enter. That's going to, going to delete everything from your flash and you may even delete your, your uh, image which is stored in the flash. You don't want to do that because the minute I reboot, there won't be an image on the ASA to reboot. So things that you should be careful about, even in the lab exam, I've, I've, I've seen people do delete star by mistake because they're like pretty nervous and they're trying to be fast, but you have to be careful when you're deleting anything from the flash. So always do a delete star.cfg or maybe copy the name and then delete your configuration file. So now I have a fresh ASA, which has no context, no configuration file in the flash. So what's the first thing that I would do as, uh, as an administrator of, of an ISP? So let's say I have a fresh ASA and I need to give a firewall as a service to my customers. So I take the ASA, connect the console, log in, give a host name, and then I would start um, uh, like do a no shot to all my interfaces. Let's do that. So that's the first thing that I do. Interface gig zero by zero, let's say no shot. And notice one thing, I cannot give an IP address. Like I said, system contacts, you cannot give an IP address. I cannot even give a name if. So no name if, I cannot do security level, Nothing. The only thing that I can do is do a no shot. I could probably set duplex and uh, speed. I could, I could do port channeling. Port channeling can be done at the system context. So I'm actually creating virtual interfaces also. So besides creating virtual firewalls and having failover for the virtual firewalls, I can also do uh, virtual interfaces, which means I am taking one interface, creating sub interfaces and allocating that to customers. So based on our diagram, we will actually use these two interfaces. Now here in this diagram, I have two separate physical interfaces, which I would bundle together as a port channel. On the LAN side, I have two physical interfaces. I would bundle them together into a port channel and then I would further divide the port channel into a sub interface to get even more customers. So obviously the physical resources is limited to the physical box. So all I would do right now is just do a no shot to all my interfaces. Say management zero by zero, no shot. So that's the first thing that I've done. The second thing that I would do is maybe create a port channel. So I would bundle gig zero by zero and zero by one into a port channel. So that's going to be done by going to my interface gig zero by zero and giving the command channel group. The group number is irrelevant. You can give whatever you want and it does not really need to be the same between two devices. See, physically, this ASA connects to a switch at the back end. So when I'm doing port channel, I have to do port channel on both sides, on the ASA and on the switch. Otherwise, your port would go into error disabled state. So you don't want that. You have to configure ether channel on both sides. Now, ASA supports static method for bundling. It also supports uh, a protocol, which is LACP. So link aggregation control protocol, it does not support PACP, which is Cisco proprietary, but it does not support PACP. So recommended is um, LACP. So we would use that. Let's just give one. So maybe we can give one. Oh, in fact, it's two here in the diagram. So let's give two. So two mode would be, if you see, I have on, which is for static and active passive is for LACP. So active means initiate the connection to form ether channel. 
passive means only respond. So I could have the ASA initiating it and the switch responding, or I could have switch initiating it and ASA responding, or I could have both of them active. They both can initiate to each other. So as long as you have active active or you have active passive, that's okay. But you cannot have uh, passive passive. So let's just keep it as active. And let's also go to my interface gig zero by one and give the same command. So both these interfaces belong to the same port channel group, which is channel group two. So what I've technically done is I have, I have, um, I have bundled these two interfaces together. However, I still have to configure the switch side. Let's go back to the switch. I believe it connects to, <clears throat> I believe it connects to the physical port on the switch. Let me just confirm which port is that. So if you go to ine.com and let's say you go to rack rentals and let's say you go to uh, CCI security schedule or in fact rack rental guide and you go to rack overview and lab wiring diagram you should be able to see the physical topology. So if I look at ASA one, gig zero by zero and zero by one connects to switch one, port number 10 and 11. So that's where I need to configure my uh, ether channel. So going back to switch one, show run interface fast ethernet one by zero by 10 and port number 11, I need to configure my ether channel. One thing you have to be careful, the two links that you're bundling together, they have to be of the same type. So you cannot bundle a fast ethernet and a gig port. They have to be, both have to be gig port or they both have to be fast ethernet. Um, another thing to think about from port channeling perspective is your running config of the two interfaces that you're bundling, they should also be the same. So what I'm going to do is go back to the switch and say interface range, fast ethernet one by zero by 10 and 11 and say channel group two mode active. So once I do this, my bundling should come up. If I do a show ether channel and hit enter, it shows that I have a layer two ether channel and uh, two ports have been bundled. Maximum ports that you can bundle is 16. I am using LACP. And if I do summary, I should see them as P. P indicates bundle, which you can see here. So now my ether channel has been done. So what I've actually done, I've gone to my ASA and I, I'm creating resources. I'm, I'm doing a no shot to my interfaces. I'm creating a virtual file or virtual interface, which is a word, uh, port channel. I'm creating all of that in the system context. Same thing I would do for my LAN segment. My LAN segment is gig two and three. So I would just go back to my interface gig zero by two and say channel group one mode active and go to port number three, channel group one port uh, mode active. And again, on the switch side, I would do the same thing. Uh, ASA one gig two and three connect to switch two on port number nine and 10. So if I look at switch two, show run interface gig one by zero by nine and 10. I need this to be a trunk port because I'm actually creating sub interfaces. So looking back at the diagram, these two links which were bundled, which were on top, the, the, the WAN links, they don't need to be a trunk port on the switch side. They are an access port. But the LAN side segment, the LAN side interface, they need to be a trunk port because I would further create a sub interface on my port channel. So I need that to be a trunk port, which I believe is already pre-configured, port number one, nine and 10. So all I would do is do my bundling. So interface gig one by zero by nine, channel group one, mode active and 10 mode active. So now my system context interfaces are ready. So if I do a show run interface, I have physical interfaces which are bundled together in port channel one and port channel two. Port channel two has my two WAN interfaces, a gig zero and gig one. 
And port channel one, which is the LAN interface, has two interfaces, gig two and gig three. However, I want to support more customers. So I am further going to divide this port channel into a sub interface. So interface So 1.1, 1 .1. because it's support, it's a sub interface, I need to define the encapsulation method. So I would just say VLAN, let's say 75, 1.2, VLAN would be 85. Now it's not really necessary that you have to do it this way. You can just allocate physical interfaces. You don't need to create port channel. It's not mandatory, but something that you desire or you should do is to give, give the customer additional redundancy. And again, if you're, if you're doing clustering, then yeah, you would require port channel anyway, because clustering works with port channel. But since we're not doing clustering, we don't really need port channel. You can allocate the physical interface directly. So my interfaces are ready. The next thing that I would do at the system context is, let's say I have customer one, which is a high paying customer and customer two, is a stingy customer, he does not really pay that much. So maybe I'll create two classes. I'll create a gold class and the gold class customers can use 50% of my resources. And maybe I create a bronze class, which is my stingy customers who pay very little. And maybe I can give them only 10% or 25% of my resources. So that's what I would do at the system context again. That's done with creating a class, let's say class gold. And here I would say, limit this uh, gold class to, let's say, connections to 50%. So 50% of my physical resource limit is reserved for my gold class. So gold class can use 50%, a maximum of 50%. Silver or maybe bronze can only use 20%. So maybe I'll create one more class. So class, let's say bronze and say limit connections to 20%. I can limit other things also. I can limit things like um, ASDM connections or all resources or connections or number of hosts um, going through the firewall or MAC addresses or routes, SSH, Telnet, VPNs, XLATs. I can limit this, all these things if I want to. I'm just keeping it simple with just saying number of connections to, I believe I already gave that. So that's all I need. So I created two classes, one is gold and one is bronze. Now I start creating the virtual firewalls. So I will create two virtual firewalls. One is customer one, one is going to be customer two. So if I go and, and create a virtual firewall by saying contacts, let's say customer one, it's gonna shout back at me saying, hey, you need to create the admin contacts first. You cannot create custom contacts without the admin contacts. You remember I deleted the admin contacts. That's there by default, but I deleted that. So it won't let me create virtual firewalls. So first thing what you do is create the admin contacts, which is done with the command admin contacts and whatever name you want. You would want to keep it as admin, not necessary, but it makes sense. So I create the admin context and then I allocate one interface to the admin context and maybe enable Telnet or SSH to that interface so that I can remotely manage this virtual context, which is the admin context or virtual firewall. That's done with context admin. So once I give that admin context as admin, I then go to context admin and here I would say allocate interface management zero by zero. So management interface is now allocated to my admin contacts. Is it dedicated? No, you can allocate the same interface to multiple virtual firewalls. So that's called as a shared interface implementation. It doesn't need to be unique. It, it's recommended to be unique because otherwise you have to do a few more things because of limitations of virtual firewalls, but it's recommended. But again, that's really not possible 
if you have just eight interfaces and let's say each customer is requiring two interfaces, which means you can only have four customers. So obviously uh, service providers will oversubscribe by creating sub interfaces, creating port channels for redundancy, and then allocating the port channels to most of the customers. Uh, management, you can assign to admin contacts, you can assign even to customer if you want. So allocate interface M0 by zero. And the second thing that you have to define is where will the configuration file, the running config of the admin contacts be stored? If I do not define that, then the minute I reboot my physical ASA, my entire running config is gone. I don't want that. See the system context, when I do write mem, it just saves the system context in the flash. So my system context is stored, but my admin context, my custom context, they are really not stored. So for me to store that config so that I don't lose the config when I reboot, that is done by, by allocating a space to that virtual firewall. And that space can be in your local flash it could be to an FTP server, whatever you want. So I would just do it in the local flash by saying config URL would be in the flash as admin.cfg. Again, this name could be anything, but it makes sense to keep the same name as the context name. It's just easier to remember. So I would just say config URL would be in the flash and the name of the file where the configuration would be stored would be admin.cfg. That's all I need for creating the admin context. Obviously, I haven't really given an IP address to the admin context. So that's going to be done by going to the running config of the admin context. And that is done with the command change to context admin. See, there's a big difference between those three commands. Admin context admin, which we gave earlier, which was here, this is to define that the context name admin is my admin context. This command is to go and uh, go into the admin context, but not the running config, go into the admin context and allocate interfaces, define where your configuration file would be stored. And this is to go to the running config. When I say actually give the command uh, change to context admin, I'm, I'm going into the running config of the admin context. So once I go there, if I do a show run interface now, you would see I only have one interface because I allocated only one interface, the management port or the management interface. So here I can give my IP address, management only command, security level, name ifs, all that I can give. I can do NAT, I can do um, like, I, maybe I can do routing. Again, it, it does support routing. So once I'm here, I can just say interface management zero by zero give an IP address, let's say 10.0.0.200.255.255.255.0. I see a message here, which says that um, cluster pool must be specified on this interface. Now, because this ASA supports clustering, it will not let me assign an IP address to an interface. That's a problem. I'm not doing clustering right now, but because this ASS supports clustering, which if you actually do a show version, you should be able to see um, that clustering is enabled, which is here. So since clustering is enabled, I would have to disable clustering. If I'm not doing clustering, you have to disable clustering which is not done from the admin context. It has to go back to the system context So change to system. And I would have to give one command. Let me in fact save this first. I believe I, I may lose my config. I should have done that command first. So the command is no cluster interface mode. Um, hopefully, yeah, we didn't lose the config. So that's a good thing. So now I have, I have disabled the clustering mode. And now I can go back to change to context um, admin and go to my interface management zero by zero and give an IP address 10.0.0.250 255 255 255 So now I can assign an IP address. Give your name if let's say MGMT uh, security level, let's say 100 and maybe say management only. 
And I can enable maybe Telnet or SSH if I want. Enable this and maybe set the password so that my Telnet works. So now my admin context is ready for remote connectivity. So now I don't need to be physically connected to my console. I could go back to my desk and do a telnet to the management interface of the, of the physical ASA, and I would reach the admin contacts. Once I reach the admin contacts, I would basically reach here on this prompt. I can just go back and say change. I can do a config T and say change to, to system from the admin contacts, and now I'm in the system context remotely. So that's the beauty of the admin context that you can remotely manage your physical ASA. So now that my admin context is ready, which means I have created the context, I have allocated interfaces, I have defined the configuration file, and I went into the running config, gave an IP address, gave a name if, gave a security level, define management only, enable telnet, I'm ready to now configure virtual firewalls. So first thing that I would do now is either physically connect to the ASA from the system context or do a telnet to the admin context and then do change to system and configure your virtual firewalls. Remember configuring virtual firewalls can only be done from the system context. How you access the system context, that depends on you. Either you use console or you telnet to admin context and use the change to system command. But you can only configure virtual firewalls from the system context. So I would just say is context, let's say C1, customer one, and hit enter. What do I do here? Customer one requires two interfaces, one for WAN, one for LAN. So I would give him two interfaces. I would just say um, allocate interface. You remember we created the port channel. So now I will allocate the port channel to him. So this was port channel two for the WAN. I would just say port channel two, now, if I do port channel two and just hit enter, the customer would know that I have done port channeling. Maybe I don't want to show that to him. I could just give an alias name to my interface. Maybe I just say WAN. And then say allocate interface port channel 1.1, which was my sub interface of the port channel for customer one, which is here, port channel 1.1. I look at that and again, I don't want him to know that I'm doing port channeling or doing sub interfaces. So maybe I'll just name this as LAN and then define the configuration file. So where would the customer's running config be stored? Because if I reboot the ASA, all customer's config is gone. We don't want that. So config URL would be in the flash and let's name this as c1.cfg. So configuration file would be customer1.cfg. And because customer one is a high paying customer, I would allocate him to the gold class that we created earlier, which is done with, he is a member of gold. So customer one creating the virtual firewall is done. Again, I would do the same thing for customer two, where I would allocate the same port channel two, like I said, the same interface can be allocated multiple times. This is called as shared interface implementation. So port channel two, again, WAN, allocate interface port channel 1.2 as LAN, and config URL would be C2. It has to be a unique name. And he would be a member of bronze. So custom virtual firewall creation is done. Let's save this config. When I do a save, it saves just the system context. It does not save the admin context. It does not save the C1 and C2 context. It only saves the running config of the system context. So you should do a write mem all. That saves system context, admin context, C1 context, C2 context. Now my context creation is done. Virtual firewall has been created. Now what do I do? Now I go into the customer's running config and I would configure an IP address, maybe enable SSH and hand it over to the customer. Now customer can do what he wants if he is managing it. If I want to manage it, maybe I charge him a fee for that 
and I manage everything. Customer will give me his requirements and I will do that. Every time there's a change requirement, customer will email me saying, hey, I need a NAT translation to be done or maybe I need a VPN service. And I, as an administrator, would do those things for the customer. So how do I go into the running config of the customer? That's done with change to context C1. So now I am in the running config of the customer. If I do a show run, how many interfaces should you see? Two interfaces. Look at the name, WAN and LAN. So customer really does not know that, hey, have I done port channeling? Is he doing virtual firewalls? He doesn't really know. I could just name this anything that I want. So all I have to do now is do give an IP address, define the name if, define the security level, enable SSH, and that's it, I'm done. Let's do that, interface WAN. See the advantage of doing it the way that I did it is I would have a failover for the physical box with the second ASA. So I have a failover for the physical box. I have a failover for the interface through port channel. Even if one interface fails, my WAN link doesn't go down because I have a backup interface and customer really does not know that I have another backup interface. He still gets connectivity. That's the good part about implementing it this way. So interface WAN, let's give an IP address. I believe the IP is, let's go and check. Show IP interface brief. R1 has been pre-configured with 155, 165. So WAN subnet is 155.1.65. Now, limitations or restrictions of doing or creating virtual firewalls. The first limitation is that every IP address of every customer, so every IP address of every interface of every customer needs to be unique. You cannot have overlapping IPs. So customer one, overlapping subnets, okay. Overlapping IP, not okay. So customer one should have a unique IP. Customer two needs to have a unique IP. The second limitation is that every customer, every interface of every customer needs to have a unique, in, uh, unique MAC address. MAC address also has to be unique. So now would my MAC address be unique at this point of time because of the implementation that I have done? No, because both customer one and customer two, they're using port channel two, right? They both are using port channel two. So the MAC address for customer one and customer two would be same. Again, for the LAN interface, they both are using port channel one. MAC address is going to be the same. That's a problem. So obviously I won't have connectivity if I don't solve that problem. So that's a limitation. And um, let's go and configure the ASA one with an IP address for C1. Let's give an IP address 155.1.65. Uh, let's say what we can give. Let's say we give 50. So customer one is 50. 255, 255, 255, 0. Name if would be outside. Security level is 0, no shot. Same thing I would do for my LAN, interface LAN. IP address would be 155.1.75.50.255.255.255.0. Name if inside, security level 100, exit. At this point of time, my virtual firewall should have back-to-back -back access with customer's network and with the ISP's WAN router network. So I should have back to back. I won't have reachability to networks behind that because I don't have a routing protocol. But if I do a back to back ping, let's say the customer's LAN edge router, 155.175.3, which is R3, I should be able to ping that, which I can. And I should be able to ping the ISP router, 155.165.1, or I think it's 11. I am able to ping that. So at this point of time, my virtual firewall is ready. My customer's running config is ready. 
I haven't enabled Telnet or SSH yet, but it's actually ready with the IP addressing. Maybe I can run some routing protocol also. So maybe I can run router, let's say OSPF1 and say network um, 155.1.0.0, 255.255.0.0, area zero. The minute I do this, the ASA customer wants a virtual firewall will form OSPF adjacency with WAN router and the LAN router. So if I look at here, ASA 1C1 will form OSPF adjacency with R1 and with R3. Not with R4 because R4 is a separate customer. So if I go and do a show OSPF neighbor, I have two neighbors, 11, which is R1, and customer's router, which is R3. So if I do a show route, I should see OSPF routes in my routing table, show route OSPF. So I have all these routes coming from ISP and maybe one route coming from customer. This is customer's route inside, which is coming from inside. And all the remaining routes are coming from the ISP, maybe a default route, Maybe some, you can run BGP if you want. So if you do a router, you have options of BGP, you have options of EIGRP, ISIS, OSPF, or maybe a static route. So normally you would run either BGP or you would run static route. You would normally not run an IGP with the ISP. In our case, it's a lab environment. So I'm just running OSPF. Customer one is ready. He, he can save his own config if he wants. Now let's go to customer two. So change to contacts, customer two. Now this command cannot be done by customer one. The reason it's ac accepting this command right now because I am connected through console. So, but if I was telnetting to customer one, I cannot issue the command change to context C2 or change to context admin or change to system. I cannot do that. Customer only has access to his own running config. Here I would do the same thing, interface WAN. I would configure the same thing. IP address 155, 165. Now, if you notice, it's the same subnet, both customer one and customer two WAN interface IP is 155.1.65, but customer one is dot 50, customer two maybe let's say dot 60. And let's give name if outside, security level zero, exit out, interface LAN, IP address would be 155.185.60, 255.255.0.0. Name if would be inside security level 100 and maybe run routing protocol. So router OSPF1 network 155.1.0.0.255.255.0.0 area zero. So again, customer two is running OSPF. He would form OSPF adjacency with ISP and his LAN customer. So if I do a show OSPF neighbor, I would see two neighbors, not R3 this time, it's R4 and ISP. So I have these two neighbors. It's still in the two way state. It should move on to the full state. Let's wait. Let's do a show. Let's go back to R1 and check show IP OSPF neighbor. So I have two virtual firewalls who are my neighbors. This is the router ID and this is the IP on which I'm forming neighbors. And now ASA customer two should have the adjacency come up, which it has. Even he should have learned all the routes, his customer's LAN routes and the WAN ISP's routes, which he has. So inside he's learned 150.4.4.1 and remaining are all WAN routes. So my virtual firewall or creating the virtual firewall is done. Now, I would like to 
uh, tell you something about the restriction in the virtual uh, firewall implementation. You remember I said that every customer needs to have a unique IP. Do we have a unique IP? Yes. So that requirement is met. The second requirement was every customer needs to have a unique MAC address. Do we have a unique MAC address? No. That's going to be a problem. Let's see that problem. What I'm going to do is from the customer, let's say CSR3, which is customer one, I will do a telnet. Ping will not work because again, I don't have any access list. Ping is not inspected. So the echo reply coming back from the internet would get dropped on the ASA. But telnet is inspected. So the request would go out and the telnet reply coming back is dynamically allowed to come back in because of inspection. So telnet should work as long as we have the routes. So if I look at R3, the customer, and do a show IP route OSPF, I have routes to the internet. I have a default route, which I've learned from the ASA. And if I look at R1, the ISP, show IP route OSPF, I have reverse traffic. I have reverse route back to R3, which you can see here. So routes are there in the routing table. I have routes to go to the internet and R1, the ISP has routes to come back in. And because I'm doing telnet, it should work because telnet is inspected, TCP is inspected. So reply packets should be allowed to come back in. Let's test this. Let's go back to CSR3, do a telnet to the ISP, let's say 150.11.11.1 and hit enter. Did the telnet work? Doesn't seem to work. It did not work. It probably got dropped. Now, what's the reason for that? Let's go back to our ASA and analyze what's happening behind the scene. Why is the ASA dropping it? So let's do a packet tracer just to see what's happening with my packet. Packet tracer input inside. And um, let's put TCP as the protocol. And source would be 155.175.3. R3 is my source. Source port could be anything. Let's say 12345, any random port. Destination is 150. 1111 destination port is going to be 23. What's happening with my packet? If I look at the packet, it says, okay, packet reached the ASA, routing lookup was done. The routing lookup said, go out the, go egress from the outside interface to the outside interface. Did I configure NAT? No. So there's no NAT config. Um, looks at the headers and it was inspected. The inspection ID was 28. Result was allow. So ASA did not drop it while going out. Let's confirm that. Did the packet reach R1, the ISP? So if I look back at R1, let's do a debug. Debug TCP, maybe IP TCP transaction. And let's go back to R3 and do a telnet again, just to see if the packet reaches R1. It did reach R1, which means R3 forwarded to ASA. ASA sent the packet out to internet to R1. So R1 got the packet, but I see something here which says um, it was closed, unknown. And what else do we see here? So I don't see any other information. I just see that it's trying to connect back, but for some reason it's not able to make that TCP connection. So I know one way my packet has reached, which means the problem could be reverse traffic. From R1, it's gonna come back to ASA on the WAN interface. From the WAN, it has to go towards the LAN. It's lower to higher traffic. Do I need an access list? No because this traffic was inspected. We saw inspection ID 28, it was inspected. So it should be dynamically allowed. Let's see if that was the case. Let's do a packet tracer again on ASA, packet tracer input outside TCP 
150 11 11 1 23 so telnet replying back to 155 175.3 on one, two, three, four, five. It says drop. Packet was dropped. Why was it dropped? Think about from perspective of this diagram now. Um, you know how packet transmits from hop by hop, right? For example, when R1, when, when CSR3 sends a packet out, uh, the source IP would be CSR3, destination IP would be R1. Source MAC address is going to be R3's MAC address. Destination MAC address would be the next hop MAC address, which is ASA. So it comes to ASA. What does ASA do? Do a routing lookup. Source IP still remains the same. Destination IP remains the same. Source MAC address has to be rewritten. So ASA rewrites the source MAC address to be himself, his WAN, IP, WAN MAC address. And destination MAC address would be R1. And he forwards the packet to R1. Now, when R1 gets the packet, what does he have to do? He has to reply back. So when he's replying back, the source IP would be R1. Destination IP would be R3. Source MAC address would be R1. Destination MAC address would be ASA's WAN IP, a WAN MAC address, which you can see here when I do, let's say, a show ARP, you can see that customer one's WAN and customer two's WAN MAC address is the same, which you can see here. So R1 doesn't really know that. R1 doesn't know that there are, there are two separate virtual firewalls. So he just rewrites the MAC address, source MAC address is R1, destination MAC address is ASA's WAN, forwards to ASA. When ASA gets the packet on the physical layer, it has to go to layer two, if layer two check passes, it goes to layer three, and then he does a routing lookup. But um, at layer two, the ASA is not able to classify that, hey, should I look at the routing table of C1, customer one, or should I look at the routing table of customer two? I don't really know that because they both have the same MAC address. So when the reply comes back, ASA gets the packet, he looks at the MAC address, but this is customer one or customer two. So whose routing table should I look at? I don't know. So he's not able to classify, uh, he's not able to classify the virtual firewall. So he drops the packet because the MAC address is the same. So whenever you have multi-contacts, you have to ensure that the MAC address is also unique. Two ways to solve this. Either I tell the customer, so, so I tell the customer, go to your WAN interface and give a unique MAC address. Do you think customer is going to do that? No. So ISP is going to do that. So I would go back to my ASA, go back to my system contacts, change to system and give a command called MAC address auto. This means generate a unique MAC address for every interface of every customer. So now if I look, at, look back at R1 and do a show ARP, look at a unique dynamic MAC address. So this is the MAC address of customer one now. This is the MAC address of customer two. So MAC address has become unique now. So I have solved the problem of the MAC address. Now, if I go back to R3 and do a telnet, telnet should work. Let's go back. And at least now I see connection refused instead of timeout. Connection refused could be maybe because R1 doesn't have telnet enabled. Let's check, show run section line. Um, yep, it's transport input none. Let's go back to line VDY 0 to 15, transport input telnet, and uh, no login. And let's go back to R3 and telnet again. So this time my telnet works. Request went out, higher to lower, is allowed by default. Reply comes back, was dynamically inspected, so reply is allowed to come back in, and my telnet works. So you see, when you do multi-contacts, you have to be careful about a few things. So make sure you, you allocate uh, resources to virtual firewalls. Otherwise, customer one may be a greedy customer and he uses all the resources and customer two is gonna call you up saying, hey, nothing is working or my connections are getting dropped because at the end, the physical resources are limited.
So you have to divide that depending on your customers and ensure that you have a unique MAC address and a unique interface. Port channeling op optional if you want to do that, but again, recommended. And obviously you should do failover also. Obviously nowadays failover is not, I mean, Cisco doesn't really recommend failover anymore. They push clustering as a solution. But um, multi-context is, is pretty much done. You can do everything else. Customer can do NAT, he can do routing, he can do access list, whatever he wants he can do because it supports everything. Let's go back to my ASA and let's save all my configs, write my mall. So now my multi-context is done. I will add failover so that we have a failover to the box. Now, ASA supports um, active standby, supports active active, uh, it supports clustering as a solution for failover. Active standby can be done in single mode. It can be done in multi-context mode also. Active active, which means both the firewalls are active. The, the reason I would want to do active active is if I have virtual firewalls. So if I'm doing multi-context, there's no point doing active standby because with active standby, one AS is always running. The second AS is not processing any data. He's just waiting for the physical ASA to fail. So my, all my customers are transiting ASA one. But if I do active, active, I could load balance. Something like how we do uh, HSRP or, or GLBP, where we actually load balance traffic saying, okay, you know what, group one goes here, group two goes here. So something similar where I could do active, active, and I could say customer one is going to go through ASA one, customer two is going to go through ASA two. So that way I am utilizing both my ASAs and they are redundant for each other. So that's what we would do. We will do active, active. And however, before I do active, active, I will show you active standby also. And then we will switch to active, active. Now, when you're doing failover, things that you should keep in mind, the ASA device model should be the same. Uh, your version should be the same. Your licensing should be the same. So these are some prerequisites for doing a failover. And so I have both the ASAs running the same code, both the ASAs having the same uh, version and uh, same licensing and there's the same model, same number of interfaces. So when I'm doing active standby or even active active, how you would start your config? Now you have to be really careful with failover. I've seen a lot of people misconfigure or maybe configure their configuration order is incorrect. And that could cause a potential problem because if ASA two becomes active and he overrides ASA one, your configuration is lost. So you should do it in the right way, maybe in the correct way, correct order. So be careful about that. So how this is going to be done, the first thing that you have to do is prepare for the virtual firewall or prepare for the failover. That's done with ensuring that the running config on the switch side, wherever they are connected, that's the same between ASA1 and ASA2. So if ASA1, the WAN interface was an access port in VLAN 65, ASA2 WAN interfaces should also be in access port in VLAN 65. The LAN ports on ASA1 was a trunk port. LAN port on ASA2 would also be a trunk port. So let's verify those things first. So I believe ASA2 WAN port connects to 13 and 14 on switch one. Let's check that. 1 by 0 by 13, it's, it's an access port in VLAN 65, and 14 is also an access port in VLAN 65. So that's so I've already done that. 
my running config on the switch side is the same. The reason I'm saying it should be the same is because the primary ASA is kind of going to probe all the interfaces, depending on which interfaces are being monitored. So let's say if, if your VLAN is wrong on ASA2, then he would not be able to reach that interface. And if that interface is not reachable, he would think ASA2 is down and it would be in failed state. So you don't want that. Make sure your running config is the same on the switch side. So show run interface, my LAN interface, I believe connects to, um, let me check, that is, uh, 13, that's 12 and 13. So one by zero by 12 and 13. So that's already a trunk port. So my switch side is okay. Let's go to, let's start configuring the failover. Now, whenever you're doing failover, whether you're doing active standby or you're doing active active, always configure active standby first. Do active standby first. Let the uh, configuration get synced. And once the sync is complete, then switch over to active active. Don't try and do active active directly because there's more chances of you um, not doing it correctly in the right order and reverse sync happen, happens. So try and do active standby first. It's easier and then one command to switch over. So we will do active standby first. So go to your primary ASA, which is ASA1, go to the system context and give a few commands. So for our failover, we would use the interface gig zero by four. Now you can use the same interface for failover, for failover messages. You can also use the same interface for stateful messages or stateful um, sync. Or you could use separate unique interfaces, one for failover, one for stateful replication. Since we only have one interface, I would use the same interface for both, for failover and also for stateful replication. So the first thing you do is to verify if your failover link is up. I believe we have show run interface gig zero by four. I think it is up, it is. So first thing that you would give the command would be failover LAN unit primary. A common mistake is what people do is they enable failover first. Don't do that. This is command should be done last. So failover LAN unit primary. Then failover LAN interface would be, um, I believe it is, you have to give a logical name to it. Let's name this as failover. And let's use the interface gig zero by four. So this is like an alias name to this interface. So this is for failover. Now, do you want stateful replication? Stateful replication means that if the primary ASA fails, the secondary ASA becomes active and your session is information is not lost, which means let's say if you were doing a telnet, your session does not get disconnected. That's stateful replication. If you don't want stateful replication, then you don't need to enable it. But if you do want stateful replication, which is recommended, you will give the command failover link uh, again, give a name to it, FOA, gig zero by four. I'm using the same interface. Since I'm using the same interface, um, both my stateful replication and my failover messages would be on the same link. Next thing, give an IP address to the failover interface. That's done with failover interface IP for FOA would be primary IP. Let's give 200.0.0.1, 255.255.255.0, and the standby IP would be 200.0.0.2. And last command would be enable failover. So I gave five commands. If I do a show run failover, I gave five commands. This command is last, I gave this one. Then I gave this, then I enabled stateful failover. I gave an IP address, primary IP and standby IP. And then I enabled failover. Five commands. Active or the primary router 
is ready. Now we go to the standby router. On the standby router, ASA2, we would first change the mode to multiple, which we've already done. Uh, before you do multi-contacts or before you do replication with failover, do a few things. Disable clustering. Otherwise, your IP addresses would not come on the standby, standby cluster. So cluster interface mode. And also do clear configure contacts. So delete all your contacts and say delete star.cfg. So delete all the configuration file. Now, all I need to do on the standby ASA is go to my failover link, do a no shot. Do a no shot to your failover link. And then go back to your primary ASA, do a show run failover, copy the last three commands as it is. Copy these last three commands. And then say failover, LAN unit secondary and enable failover. That's it. Active standby is done. Replication will begin. So detected an active mate. My context got created. Everything got created. It just gives me a warning that standby IP is not given for customers, which I have to, but I don't care about that right now. Replication is complete. If I go back to my primary ASA and do a show failover, you would see that primary ASA or the ASA one is, is primary as a whole box and he's active uh, for admin contacts, for C1, C2, he's active basically. It says waiting. You should not see waiting for a long time. If you see waiting for more than two or three minutes, it's the interface is probably going to fail because maybe there's no connectivity between ASA1 and ASA2 on that interface. Maybe your VLAN is incorrect on the switch. So something that you've done misconfiguration, there's no connectivity. So check your VLANs, check your if your interface is up and running. Let's go back and do a show failover again. So this interface has come up. It says not monitored. We'll talk about that later, but the main thing to look at is the second box is showing a secondary and it shows failed. The interface shows failed. So um, something happened with the box that it's not showing, it's showing basically failed. Why would that happen? You remember that we had done port channeling. We had done port channeling on ASA1. Did I configure port channeling on ASA2? No, but when the replication happened, ASA2 has port channel now, but the switch side where ASA2 connects, I did not configure port channel, which means the switch must have brought the link down because of error disabled state. And now ASA2 shows that as failed state. So I must go back to switch one and configure ether channel here also for ASA2. So that is going to be on port number 13 and 14. So interface range fast ethernet one by zero by 13 and 14 channel group. Now, what channel group did we use on ASA one? We use port channel two, correct? Do not use port channel two here. Use something else because what's going to happen? Physically, my, my ASA, there are two separate ASAs, right? Let me in fact, draw it. So I have two, so I have two physical ASA. This is one ASA. This is one ASA. So ASA two, ASA one, and this is my switch. I have two links here bundled together. I have two links here bundled together. I had given port channel two here, port channel two here. Now, if I go and give port channel two here, no problem on this side. On ASA2, anyway, the replication must have happened from ASA1. So he will ASA2 will also have port channel two. But on the switch side, if I give port channel two, what's going to happen? On the switch side, these four links will get bundled. So the switch will assume 
I connect to one ASA, but it's that's not the case. There are two ASAs. If I was doing clustering, then both these ASAs become as if they were one ASA. So the switch would only see one ASA if I was doing clustering, but I'm not doing clustering. So there are two separate physical ASAs. So the switch has to also see them as two separate physical ASAs. So on the switch side, I would give something else, maybe 22. ASA side doesn't matter, but switch side, it matters. So I need, I need these two port channels to be different. Otherwise, obviously your, your ASA would think that ASA2 is not responding. The two links is not responding because as a standby device, I don't process anything. I'm only standby. So if, AS, if the switch does not receive any information from ASA2, he would think the link is down. That's why I configure a separate port channel. So going back to my switch, I would give channel group, let's say 22 mode active. And on switch to interface range, gig one by zero by, I believe it is, um, 12 and 13, channel group, again, here I'll give something different, channel group 11, mode active. So once I do this, if I go back to my interfaces, come back, goes down and comes back up. If I look back at ASA, my, my standby should start coming up. Now it's standby ready. That's what we want first. Get your sync to happen. Let your primary ASA show as active, let your standby ASA show as standby ready. Once that's done, then look at this. Why do we see 0000? zero, zero, zero? Because I didn't define a standby IP. So now I got to go back to all my contacts, all my customers. Let's go to change to admin, change to contacts admin. And on my management port, I will give an IP address. So I will give a standby IP. So standby, let's say 10.0.0.251. Then I will say change to contact C1, give an IP to the WAN standby IP. Everything is done on the primary ASA, nothing on the standby. So st uh, standby would be 155.165. Let's give 51. And LAN would be 155.175.51. Let's go to change to contact C2, do the same thing. One fifty five dot one dot sixty five dot sixty one and the LAN would be one fifty five one eighty five dot uh, sixty what is it sixty sixty one that's it so I gave a send by IP and now I can go back to change the system and do a show failover. You would see that all the primary IPs 250, 50, 50, 60, 60 is on the primary ASA. All the standby IPs is on the secondary ASA. Now wait for some time till this waiting goes away. It'll go in in maybe a minute. So it should all show, it should not show as waiting. It should either show as monitored or it should show as not monitored. You should not see waiting for a long time because if you see waiting, then it's a problem. Maybe there is a link connectivity issue. Let's check. So I see that this management port is still in no link or waiting. Let's check where the management port connects on the switch side. So management connects to switch one, port number nine and 12. Go run interface one by zero by nine. It's shut down, so I should do a no shut. And let's check 12, no shut. 
Yep, so my management board should be up now. It's testing. Give it about a minute for it to get normal. Because again, on the switch side, there's panning tree, which has to kind of run. Now it's normal, which is a good sign. It's still showing waiting, which means it's trying to communicate. And now it's up and running, it's showing monitored. So now I see two options here, monitored or not monitored. Uh, monitored means that if the link fails, switchover would happen. Not monitored means if the link fails, there would be no failover. So let's say if my inside interface fails, failover will not happen. So if you want to monitor that, I could go back to the customer, change to contact C1 and say monitor interface inside also. Go to customer two and say monitor interface inside also. And now if I do a show failover, you would see that all interfaces are basically being monitored, all the interfaces. So any of the link fails. When I say link, it means my entire port channel. If my only one link fails, port channel is still up. So my failover will not happen. But if both the link fails from the bundle, then the port channel goes down, which means failover will get triggered and it switches to the secondary ASA. So now all interfaces are basically monitored. This is active standby. Both my customers, C1 and C2, would be using the primary ASA, which is ASA1. ASA2 is just at the side waiting for ASA1 to fail. That's why we don't really want active standby. It's a waste of resource. So you might want to do, or you may want to do uh, active active. To do active active, you should configure active standby first and then switch over to active active. Active active is only supported with multiple context mode. You cannot do this in single mode. Now to do active active, we don't touch ASA2 at all. The standby ASA, we don't touch him at all. We just go to the primary ASA. And the first command we will give is, uh, let's in fact first save it, write mem all. Let's just save our configs. So the first command that we would do to do active active is disable failover first. Once your replication is done, everything is done, active standby is working, disable failover on the primary ASA. Then create two failover groups. So failover group one, so let's say this group one is going to be primary. Always do a preempt because if you don't do a preempt, there's no preempt by default. If you don't do a preempt, then if the primary ASA fails, a secondary ASA becomes active. If the primary comes back up, he would not become active. He would become standby. So if you do a preempt, it forces a re-election. Create one more group, failover group two, Let's put this as secondary and again preempt. So I made two failover groups. Group one is primary, group two is secondary. Now I would go to my contacts C1 and say join failover group one and go to contacts C2, say join failover group two. So what I've essentially said, C1 is going to go to the primary ASA. Who was the primary ASA? ASA one. C2 is going to go to the secondary ASA. Who was secondary ASA? ASA2, who was standby. So effectively what's going to happen is ASA1 is going to be active for C1 and standby for C2. And ASA2 would be standby for C1, but active for C2. Once you've done this, all you have to do is enable failover again. That's it. Your active active is done.
configuration replication is done. Two groups created. And if I go back and do a show failover now, look at the configuration. This host is primary, right? For group one, which is C1, he's active. For group two, he is standby. Look at the standby IPs on the primary ASA, 61, 61. And the secondary host, which is ASA2, he is standby for group one, which is C1, and he's active for C2, which is group two. So effectively, if I see C1 has 51 IP, but C2 has 60 IP with the primary IP. So now I have done load balancing also with active active where my C1 customers would be using ASA1 to exit out and C2 customers would be using ASA2 to exit out. Active, active standby is pretty straightforward. Active active is pretty straightforward. Always configure active standby first and then switch over to active active. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed this webinar. I will now answer some questions. Let me go back to the questions. Um, so I see a question uh, that, do you plan to complete the CCI security V6 exam lab course? So if you're asking about, we already have a V6 lab course as a video course. Um, but if you're talking about uh, workbooks or um, anything, we would, we would we basically have uh, videos to supplement that. I think they're already on INE's portal. If you actually go to, let's go to INE.com. So if you go here and go, let's log in. And if you search, let's say networking, you should see CCI security. Let's just search here. So CCI security V6 exam reviews there. And there's a learning path also. So which you can see probably if you go to discover uh, learning path and here you can search for CCI security learning path. So you should see it here also. So we already have the course uh, uploaded, which is here CCI security V6. It's done by one of my colleague, uh, Peter. So it's about 20, 258 hours of video course. Okay, then uh, I see another question. Is this possible to run high availability? I believe you already did that. And then I see another question. Uh, what's the meaning of port channel mode on? So mode on is static method where there's no protocol negotiation. We do static configuration on both sides. And difference between LSCP and PACP, LSCP is a standard versus PACP, which is Cisco proprietary. They both are protocols for ether channel negotiation. Uh, does the ASA support interface range command? I believe not but I can still check. I don't think it supports. Yeah, it does not support. It would be nice if it did, but it does not. Um, I see another question. Will the lab diagram be also available? If you're talking about the lab diagram, which is here, I think during the course of the video, you should see the diagram because I'm switching over to diagram pretty often. But I can share that if you if you just ping me, uh, maybe send me an email or something. I can I can share this diagram. So I see another question: Does the admin contacts bypass username password for all contacts? No. 
So if let's say the customer is um, changing the password, you need to know the password. Uh, system contacts will kind of bypass everything because you're on console. And then I see another question. If you are remotely connected to the admin contacts, can you switch between custom contacts you create or you must be in the console to switch between custom contacts. If you are connected remotely to the admin context, you can do a change to whatever context you want. But if you if you if you are remotely connected to a custom context, you cannot do a change to command. And then I see another question that multiple contexts means similar like VLAN. I mean, kind of it's like a multi-tenancy or like logically dividing the physical ASA into multiple physical ASAs. Then I see another question. How would you route traffic between customer one and customer two? To route traffic between customer one and customer two, it is going to go outside. So always think of it as two separate physical ASAs. So the logical diagram in your head should be something like this. So I have customer one here connects to an ASA. This is WAN, this is your internet. There's another ASA and then there is customer two. So if customer one wants to talk to customer two, it has to go from LAN interface to WAN, then from WAN to LAN. So you have to think about access list on both the ASAs. It never goes from inside to inside. It has to, it's, it's treated as two separate ASAs. Um, then I see, is there any pros or cons between shared port channel? and shared port channel with sub interfaces. There is no pros and cons to that. It just depends on um, how many interfaces you want to create, or let's say you want to have separate VLANs to segregate. Let's say within the customer, I have two separate segments, which I want to separate, then maybe I can create sub interfaces. But let's say if there are two separate customers, you don't need to create sub interfaces. You can just create a port channel and allocate the same port channel to both the customers. Then I see any tip for updating such a setup. I don't know what that refers to. And it says, can we configure failover via ASDM? Uh, yes. Does it make a difference between using static and LSCP? It doesn't make a difference. The only problem with static is that um, with static, there's no negotiation, which means if you misconfigure, all your links go down. With, with LACP, you're actually negotiating that can be from ether channel. That's why a protocol is better than using static. Okay, uh, I see, I will take one more question is, when defining classes, can we limit CPU resources per class? I believe CPU is not there. You can limit connections, XLATs, SSH, ASDM connections, but I don't think we can uh, restrict CPU. And one last question, will you be running FTD webinars? Um, it's not planned yet, but if I get enough requests, then definitely I would love to do an FTD webinar. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed and I will see you on Thursday, which is day after tomorrow for the second webinar. All right, thank you guys.